Praise the Lord. You can be seated in the presence of God this morning. Listen, I want to pray. I want to pray. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, no other spirit but Holy Spirit. No other spirit but Holy Spirit. Spirit of fear. The exit is your portion. Spirit of apathy. The exit is your portion. Spirit of doubt. The exit is your portion. No other spirit but the Holy. The spirit of fatigue and weariness. No other spirit but the Holy Spirit. I like, like, like someone breathing into someone who's dead. God, I pray for the breath of God to go into the lungs of your sons and daughters and that new life would flow into their veins in this moment, God. No other spirit but the depression, the spirit of depression. You're not welcome in, your, in the believer's life, God. We just thank you. I'm just, I feel this in my spirit. Come on, I just feel it. No other spirit but Holy Spirit. No other spirit but Holy Spirit. No other spirit but Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. No other spirit but the Holy Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, <laughs> we say we're free to worship. We say we're free to praise. We say we're free to smile. We thank you that although the spirit of fear is not our portion, we thank you for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and gentleness. I thank you that we're going to see the goodness of you in the land of the living, oh God. That's our portion. That's our inheritance. We receive it in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, unlock something in this house that cannot be locked back. Unlock something in the believer's life that cannot be locked back. Open a door that cannot be shut again, Lord. Unveil something in the mind of your son and daughter that cannot be forgotten. We call it out. We call it forth in Jesus' name. Somebody give him one last praise. Come on, give him one last praise. Before we move into the word, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2 is where we're going to be. We were, in, um, we were in a series entitled The Undignified Church. We started it two weeks ago, and then last Sunday, Holy Ghost took over, and I couldn't get past point one. It's a good service when you can't get past point one. Well, y'all wasn't here, or maybe I'm delusional. We're going to pray for one of us. Uh, no, I'm ready. It was a great, great day. And I believe the Lord provided some healing, some atonement for some people in, in this season. And, and so I, I went back to study and preparing, finishing up my notes this week for you. And, and I just decided that if I couldn't get past point one last week, I'm probably not going to get past point two this week. So I decided we were just going to work this thing, and, and I believe the Holy Spirit has spoken, and, and God is going to move. And so the, the subtitle of this message today is The Ark is Open, and it, you can say part two or point two, whichever one you want to say, but, but we're going to go to point number two or part number two of this message, this series today. And, and while you're turning there, let me just ask you to uh, be in prayer. Uh, tonight, I'm ministering at a church over in Concord, and, um, and, and I'm... I'm I'm preaching at a church over in Concord, and um, I believe the Lord is sending me on assignment. I don't take preaching gigs. I don't gig. Y'all wear me out on Sunday. I like my naps. And, and so I, I don't gig, but I do go on assignment. And, and uh, this is not my profession. This is my calling. And so the Lord has asked me to assign me to go and preach in Concord tonight um, at a church called Remedy, Remedy Church over in Concord and um, just, just be in prayer with me. It starts at six thirty. If you've got nothing going on, come with me. We lay hands on everybody for us over with. Uh, and, and and the assignment on my life is to overwhelm this pastor with what a full congregation looks like. So I am I'm, I'm legitimately inviting you to go with me. And uh, it's interesting because Concord is a melting pot of a lot of cultures, like this area of Charlotte is. And but it's incredible to me how isolated, segregated that area is in Concord. And I believe one of the things the Lord has anointed us to do is break that stuff off, people. Let me say it again. I believe the Lord has anointed us to break that bigotry, that racism, that segregation off of people. Okay, that's stuff. Maybe I'm already there. I don't know. But I believe the Lord has anointed us 
to, okay, y'all with me? So, so I, God's called me to go preach, but I would love for you to come with me because I believe he's anointed us to break that. And, and I would love nothing more for him to see what a, number one, what a packed out church looks like. And number two, what a packed out church that looks like heaven looks like. I want him to catch a vision for what heaven's going to be. And so um, if you have nothing going on, 630 uh, over in Concord, Remedy Church. Um, I believe it's, if you, if you follow me on social media, I believe it's on my social media as well. I'd love for you to come, nothing more. We'll go out to dinner afterwards if you, if you want to hang out with me. And I'll let you buy. <laughs> I'm just being serious. And uh, uh, I just, I'll, I'll let you buy. And, uh, no, I was kidding. Um, I won't, I, yeah, I still, I'll, I'll let you buy. That's the truth. It'll set me free. And uh, no, we, I'd love to just spend time and get to know. If you can make it, I would love for you to be there. Nothing more. I've already had several people say, hey, Pastor, we're coming uh, to support. Now, look, don't come watch. If you're going to come, clock in. Because there's a work for us to do. All right, if you're going to come watch, then just, you know, I think the NFL started. So just, you know, watch your reruns or whatever. Okay, amen. Let me move on. Let's, uh, let's get into the word today. We started last week. And I use Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 as, as the launching pad of last week's message, where Jesus said, um, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus said, I'm going to build something. This word that became flesh, this word that spoke in existence, and light became light, and the sun, the moon, the stars, the land, the fish, the birds of the air, um, uh, the creeping, crawling things, and also the cattle in the field, all came at the word of the Lord. But Jesus comes in in Matthew and he says, I'm going to put my hands to something and I'm going to build my church. And when I build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The New Testament church is a picture. It is the manifestation of the illustration of the arcs of the Old Testament. I will remind you that there are three arcs in the Old Testament. You have what's Noah's, known as Noah's Ark. And I will just tell you that it is not Noah's Ark. It was God's Ark that Noah built. Because if, Noah, if it's Noah's Ark, then Noah had to protect it. But it wasn't Noah's Ark. It was God's Ark that Noah was obedient to build. Jesus says, like Noah of the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 7, I'm going to build something. And when I build something, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And, and I just want to remind you by way of introduction that the first point of last week's message found in Genesis chapter number 7 is that the ark is the place for people. It, it's the place for people. It's, it's the place for for people. It, it is a place, place for the unclean people, and it is also a place for the clean people. It's a place for people, whether they got everything together, or they had, or they, for people that had to kick everything in the room just to try to make it all fit. It's for the people who are going through good times. It's the people who are going through bad times. It's the people that's got preacher or pastor in front of their name, and it's the people that's got drug addict or addict, addiction at the end of their name. It's for the people who are living in the million dollar houses, and it's for people who are living in no houses at all. It's for people who have cardboard and for those who have a credit card. It's for people who got a ride here to make it here. It's for people who got to choose out of five vehicles whether they got here or not. Red, yellow, black and white, polka dotted, candy stripe. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what creed you are. It does not matter your socioeconomic status. It is a whosoever gospel. He is a whosoever Lord. So it has to be a whosoever ark. The church is a place for people. It is not a place for the pastor only. It is not a place for the elders only. It is not a place for all the spiritual people only. No, bring your hurting, bring your wounded, bring your scars. We'll go out into the highways and the hedges if we got to. And just like the highways and the hedges and the people who got it all together, the assignment of the ark is to get everybody in so the flood doesn't drown away the destiny on their lives. What the ark to Noah was, Jesus said, I'm going to be to the church. Today I want to move to the next step, and I'm going to preach for about 20 minutes to give you my introduction for the point number two out of this message, this series. We find it in the book of Exodus, chapter number two. Read those first, voice, first four voice, verses with me. Watch this. And a man of the house of, Is of Levi went and took his wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. This is Moses. And she went and she saw that he was, Moses was a goodly child. She hid Moses for three months. 
But when she could no longer hide Moses, she took an ark of bulrushes for Moses and daubed it and with asphalt and with pitch and put the child, Moses, in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done for him. I want you to see this in verse number one and verse number two, that, that Moses has been conceived... Moses has been conceived by a man of the house of Levi, a priest, and the daughter of Levi. He was a servant of the priest, but it was a daughter of the priest that came together, and they conceived this boy, this child that we know as Moses. And I want you to understand something this morning, that, that Moses did not call Moses. Moses did not place Moses. God had an anointing and a call and a purpose for Moses. And it preceded the connection between his mother and father. The Bible tells us that before we were even conceived in our mother's womb, that God already knew us and he had shaped us for who he is. And I want to tell somebody this morning this very thing. Your purpose has been supernaturally placed. Uh-huh. Your purpose has been supernaturally placed. That you did not give yourself gifts. You did not give yourself talents. You did not give yourself ability. Your purpose has been supernaturally placed. It, it is because of the supernatural divinity of God himself, his grace and his mercy, that he looked down at the possibility of who you were going to be and said, I am going to infuse destiny on the inside of this man, destiny on the inside inside of this woman and I am going to supernaturally place purpose on the inside of this individual watch this Moses was born in trouble he was born into trouble this 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 at the command of Pharaoh this wicked corrupt king this wicked corrupt ruler this one who ruled with a brutal iron fist he knew instinctively that there was a deliverer that was going to be birthed in the generation so the mandate on his life was to eliminate the generation to infanticide the entire generation because if he could kill all of the kids maybe he could kill the redemptive process of God but I'm here today to tell you it doesn't matter how many kids you abort it doesn't matter how many kids you be, listen to me it doesn't matter what you try to do to abort the presence and the purpose of God if your purpose did not come by natural instincts it cannot be removed because of natural things it has been supernaturally divinely placed and divinely infused into your life and it cannot be destroyed in natural circumstances because it was supernaturally placed watch this Pharaoh said I'm gonna take every child born watch the brutality and I want you to take every child that has been born and I want you to throw them in the Nile River every child born was to be drowned in the Nile River and what the water did not drown the crocodiles would devour This is the way that Pharaoh had decided the culture of this generation was going to be started in. They would take these little babies and they would take their mothers, I'm assuming, screaming behind them in pain and in agony and throw every child into the Nile River. And if the, the baby actually hit the water, they would drown in the Nile River. But some of them landed in the mouths of the crocodiles to be devoured. This is what Moses was born into. He was born into a season that was meant to devour and destroy him. He was born into a generation that was never supposed to amount to anything. He was born into a generation that was not supposed to fulfill the purpose of deliverance that that generation was birthing. But I want you to know that in spite of the mandate, in spite of what was happening to the generation around them, there was something supernaturally infused on the inside of Moses that kept him from the fulfillment of what happened to every other person in that child. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying that if the devil could have killed you, he would have already done it by now. He would have already devoured you. He would have already drowned you. He would have allowed that past season of pain, hurt, and failure to be the ultimate demise of your existence. But look at you still sitting here. Look at you still standing here. He tried his best to discourage you. He tried his best to stop you. He tried his best to wound you. He tried his best to get you to take that knife, to take that gun, and end it all. But here you are sitting here today. If he could have killed you, he would have done it a long time ago. But here you are. Why are you? 
you still here? Because your purpose has been supernaturally placed inside of your life. And though they fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand because there's supernatural purpose, it will not draw nigh into you. Somebody thankful you're still here ought to give him praise. Yeah, 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 you're still here. In spite of that pain, in spite of that failure, in spite of those rejections, in spite of those wounds, in spite of those scars, and truthfully, in spite of those sins, you're still here. Destiny is still here. Purpose is still here. Why? Because it has been supernaturally infused into your life. Uh, I want you to hear me today. And your attack is an indicator of how you are seen in the spirit realm. Your attack is an indicator of how you are seen in the spirit realm. I'm going to say it again. Your attack is an indicator of how you are seen in the spirit realm. Why? Because your purpose has been supernaturally placed you have to learn to see with spirit eyes, not natural ones. What you see is rejection. What you see is pain. What you see is the possibility of your now. But what you have to realize is that your enemy is attacking you of what they're seeing in the spirit of what God has supernaturally placed over you. I remind you that in one of the most difficult seasons of Job's life, the Lucifer comes up to God and says, God, I need you to remove the hedge of protection because I can't get to him. What? Lucifer was operating in the spiritual authority, not in the natural substance of who he is. And Job said, thank you, Lord. There's a fullness of hedge. I'm here today to tell somebody who hears the devouring roars of your lion trying to intimidate you with his words. You need to understand the reason why all he can do is talk is because because there's protection all around you and he can't get to you in the spirit realm. Uh, when I was praying for you on Friday, here's what I heard the Lord tell me to tell somebody. Your purpose is greater than the enemy's punch. You didn't hear what I said. Your purpose is greater than the enemy's punch. I feel like Fred G right here. Your purpose is greater then the enemy's punch. And, hold on, hear what I'm saying. Woo, some of you got Fred G. That's Sanford's son right there. Yeah, your purpose is greater than the enemy's punch. And you need to look at the devil like all else and say, you old fish-eyed fool. You meant it for evil. But God's doing something. All right. I got a whole nother sermon to preach in a few hours. I'm ready to go now. Your, your purpose is greater than the enemy's punch. Yes, you've taken a lick. Yes, you've taken a hit. No, it has not thwarted your destiny. No, it has not waylaid God and God sitting around stressing out about how he's going to turn it. No, his plans are steadfast. His plans are true. And maybe even though maybe you don't understand what he's doing, he's working it together for your good. Supernaturally placed. Verse number two of Exodus says this, watch this, that she conceived him and when she saw that he was a goodly child I love this this word good, goodly in the Hebrew it translates to be valuable in estimation when she recognized the value on him when she recognized the value in him she could not put him to the fulfillment of what everyone else in the generation was experiencing because she recognized the value in him. I thank God for people who saw things in me that I couldn't see in myself. I thank God for people who were calling to the king in me in spite of the criminal that was manifested. Y'all, I know y'all so holy you glow in the dark, but I got a testimony here. I need you to understand there were things I couldn't see in myself that people would begin to prophesy and call to the king on the inside of me, the authority, the, the, the you understand, the victor in me in spite of the victimization I was experiencing. She saw the value in estimation. Watch this. His faith was supposed to be that of every other child in his generation. But there was something that was different about him. What was it? What made him different? Because he had blue eyes? Because his mommy and daddy were together? What was different? Because he was born in a nice home? What was different? Because he had things? No. What was different is he had divinity that had purposed him before he was ever conceived. And, and I need you to understand, your purpose is more powerful than your problem. 
Your purpose is more powerful than your pain. Your purpose is more powerful than your peril. I'm going to say it again. Your purpose is more powerful than your problem. Your purpose is more powerful than your pain. And your purpose is more powerful than your peril. You have to recognize and weigh God's plan versus the pain of your now and realize that greater is he. And greater is it than what you're having to incur. Watch this. Because your destiny makes you different. Your destiny makes you different. It is not your clothes. It is not your shoes. It is not your style. It is not what you get to do. It is not what people recognize you for. It is not even the gifts of God on the inside of you. No, what makes you different is the destiny that was on your life. The destiny that is on your life. And the reason why you cannot fit in and you cannot find placement in the society with the generation that you live in, the reason why you can't fit in in your job is because there's something in divinity that has a destiny on you that is different than anything else that anybody else is dealing with and the generation is going in one direction but you feel God constantly pulling you in another and I'm here today to prophesy to somebody the reason why he's called you from them is because when they realize the storm coming they're going to look to you because you're looking to him destiny makes you different destiny makes you different it's destiny that makes you different The reason why you can't fit, the reason why it doesn't work is because destiny makes you different. One of my children went through a very difficult season over the past year and a half where I sat with one of my children. And they cried and they were frustrated and prayed because of rejection after rejection after rejection. Well, I'm not even going to Noah's going through this season. He's 17 now. Just throw his name out there. It's going to make sense here in a second. He's going to be so glad when God delivers him. Going through a very difficult season. Rejection after rejection after rejection. Going through a rejection of a very intense relationship. Found pain in it in those seasons. We sat down one day over the course of our sabbatical, and he's like, but Dad, you don't realize I have dealt with this rejection all of my life. I thought I, thought I found a close friend, and, and it didn't work, and then it didn't work, and then it did work. He's gone through rejection after rejection after rejection. And I'm not painting him to be a victim. I just want you to understand the process. So what he did is he decided instead of being bitter, I'm going to be better. So every time he began to get frustrated or lonely, you know where he went? He went to a basketball court. Because you, you make pain your fuel. You use rejection as a fuel injection for favor. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Dad's talking now. So he goes to a basketball camp just a few weeks ago, right before we went on sabbatical. And he's sitting up in Ohio. And he's, and, and he's wondering because he's not six foot six. Yet, in Jesus' name. Father, we just decree it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Goes over to a basketball camp up, up in Ohio, doesn't know anything about anything. After about 15 minutes of him being on the basketball court, the head coach of the basketball team, D D2 school, begins walking around going, who's this kid, who's this kid, who's this kid? By the end of the camp, the, ki the, the coach walks up to Noah and says, son, I just want you to know you're a very good basketball player. When you graduate next year, I want you to play for us. Yeah. Watch this. I want you to hear me. A dream all of his life has been able to be able to play basketball with a scholarship in Jesus' name. But he had to endure great seasons of rejection. But he had a choice to make in his rejection. Am I going to get bitter or am I going to get better? And the reason, he said to us while we were on the sabbatical, he said, Dad, I'm so thankful for the people that walked away because it gave me the space to practice more, to shoot more, to dribble more. Listen, you have no idea why you're going through what you're going through. But I prophesy it's creating capacity for the fullness of the purpose in your life. Sorry, it worked. Destiny makes you different. Watch this. She conceived him, recognized his value, that he was a goodly child. Here it is. Look at it. So she hid him. She, she hid him. This word hid in, in the Hebrew, it means, watch this, to be isolated and set apart from normal surroundings. 
She recognized his value, so she isolated him. What we would think is that since you have great value, you should be put on a pedestal and displayed for all of social media. But the only way he could fulfill purpose that had been supernaturally, divinely given is to first be recognized of value and then to be hidden with it. Oh, I feel prophetic in this moment. She hid him. I want you to know that we all go through seasons of feeling isolated and alone. We all go through seasons where we feel like we don't fit and no one even knows or cares what we're going through. We all go through seasons, even in marriage, where we're laying in bed with someone who has no idea what we're dealing with in our minds. We all go through seasons where we feel hidden, we feel isolated, we feel alone, and, and most of all, we feel stuck. This is never going to change. This is never going to, about the time I feel like it's turning around is about the time I get smacked and put right back in behind, hidden. Reminded of the story of, of David. David is the runt of the litter of the house of Jesse. And when the prophet Samuel comes to, to find out who the king is that's going to replace Saul, Jesse, the father, lines up all of the other sons. And, and the prophet goes one by one by one by one by one and says, he's not it, he's not it, he's not it, he's not it, he's not it. He finally whirls around to Jesse and says, Jesse, don't you have another boy? Because I don't see supernatural purpose in front of all these natural abilities. And he goes, oh, oh I, I got one more boy, but watch this. He's out in the pasture tending sheep. He's isolated. He's pushed out. He's pushed alone. He's hidden. He's not allowed to fit in or be a part of the crowd or be a part of even his own family. I got one more boy. He's out there tending sheep. You need to understand that it is in the seasons of isolation that you'll find out the substance of who your Father God is. You'll find out His character when you're hidden. You'll find out who His calling is when you're hidden. And you'll find out who your real focus and faith is in when you go through seasons of being hidden as well. For you see, it was out in the pasture by himself, tending sheep where nobody knew his name, nobody knew anything about him, that he was creating instruments and said, God, if nobody else knows my name, I want you to know that I know your name. That's why I say you are my shepherd and I shall not want. You make me to lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside the still waters and you restore my soul. It was in the pasture where he found out that he would, he would have his head anointed with oil and his cup would run over. He found out in the pasture that goodness and mercy was following him all the days of his life. It was in the hidden season where he found out the faithfulness of God the most. She hid him. But while he was hidden, he was growing. I'm here today to tell somebody in this room who feels isolated who feels alone, who feels stuck, who feels like no one knows where you are. God knows where you are, and he put you there because of your value. And the reason he put you there is because he wanted his value, the investment he's made into you, to increase in his value. While he was hidden, he began to grow. And I'm here today to tell somebody in this room, the reason why you've gone through seasons of isolation is because God's been growing you. God's been developing you. God's been training you. David, while he was in the past, should not only learn how to build instruments, but he also know how to use weapons. And before he ever stood in front of the nation to defeat a giant, he had already been in the hidden place, defeating the lion and the bear in his life first. And I'm here today to tell you, God's got you hidden because God's growing you and developing you so that when it's time to come forth in front of the nation, you will be able to know that he was faithful in the little things, and now he's made your ruler because of the many. 
Oh, I'll remind you. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke chapter 2, I believe it is, that even while Jesus was hidden for 30 years, that he began to grow. Verse 52, I believe it is, that he began to grow in wisdom and in stature. And I'm here today to tell you the reason why God's got you hidden and it feels like it's been for years is because your wisdom is growing and your stature is growing and your patience is growing and your goodness is growing and your anointing is growing and he's got you hidden because of how valuable you are. Some of you feel like you're hidden because of what you did wrong but I'm here today to tell you you're hidden because of what's in you that's right while he was hidden he grew the pain of your isolation I want you to hear me is not isolated pains it's growing pains the pain of your loneliness is not lonely pains, it's growing pains. God is growing you while he's got you hidden. But I love verse number three. But when she could no longer hide him, he grew to the place he could no longer be hidden. He had a conscious decision to make. Am I going to be bitter or am I going to get better? And he grew. He didn't whine. He didn't complain. He wasn't sitting around going, I can't believe everybody else is getting to go to the river. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Come on. We look at sinners and go, oh, man, they're having the time of their life. Yep, going right to the Nile where the crocodiles are. Having the time of their life. They're laughing all the way to destruction. There's a way that seems right to a man, but it's in. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And we're sitting around going, I got to be stuck out here hidden. I ain't even a part of anything else going on. And they're laughing all the way to the river every Sunday afternoon. But I promise you, by the time this thing's over with, rejection has been for your protection. Okay. He grew to the place he could no longer be hidden. And I didn't say this in the first service, but I feel prompted of the Holy Spirit. The reason why some of us are experiencing extended seasons of isolation that have gone beyond the extension of what God had decreed is because we have refused to grow. Our complaint has been more important than our growth. Some of us have been living in seasons that have been extended much further than what he has decreed because our mouth has kept us there. Thank you, Holy Ghost. But I want you to see this. She hid him until she could no longer hide him. And when she could no longer hide him, she had to take him to the river. Watch this. His mother knew his survival was contingent upon his placement. His survival was contingent upon his placement. The reason why your mama took you to church every time the doors were open is because she knew your survival was contingent upon your placement. I told them in the first service, I, got, I had a drug problem growing up. I was drugged to church on Sunday morning. I was drugged to church on Sunday night. I was drugged to church at Women's Auxiliary on Monday. I, was, I, I mean, some of the women in the church had hair, but not like this. You understand what I'm saying? Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Uh, I got drugged to church on Tuesday, uh, choir practice. I got drugged to church on Wednesday for, for the Bible study, and on Thursday for a prayer meeting, and on Friday for whatever we had going. I drugged the church every time. Anybody else got my testimony? You got drugged to church every time the doors were open. Let me tell you why I got drugged to church. It's because God knew that I had to be in place if I was ever going to fulfill my purpose. See, I had no idea I was going to end up being a preacher. All I knew is that the moment I could make a decision to not go to church, like a fat boy in dodgeball, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out of here. I'm done. I'm tired of going to church. I had enough church for 15 lifestyle, li lifetimes. I had enough. I had enough in myself. But what I didn't realize is that my mother and my father and my grandmother and my grandfather and all of my aunts and all of my uncles and all of my cousins, we went to church because the church was the only place we could find refuge and safety and the understanding of what our purpose and destiny was really about. Yes. 
Which leads me to point number two. Why? Why did Moses have to be placed in the ark? Because the ark is the place for protecting purpose. The church is the place where your purpose is protected. I want you to hear me today. Antoine, go ahead. I want you to hear me today. Watch this. Moses went in the Nile just like every other child of his generation. Moses had to endure the crocodiles like every other child of his generation. Moses was put in the river too. Moses had to deal with the water too. Moses had to encounter the crocodiles too. But the thing that survived his purpose being relieved, re re revealed was when she placed him in something that had to deal with it. Moses had to endure the ark and the ark had to endure the Nile. Hang with me. Moses had to deal with what the ark had going on inside of it. While the ark had to deal with the crocodiles because of what the Nile had going on inside of it. Every other child in his generation went from the river's edge straight into dealing with the Nile water and the Nile crocodiles. But Moses was insulated in something that still had to deal with the water and the ark and the crocodiles. Watch this. Moses had to deal with what was happening in the ark while the ark had to deal with what was happening in the Nile. Hang on. We have to contend with what happens in the church. But the church has to contend with what's happening in the world. Otherwise, the alternative is jump out of the church and good luck with the crocodiles. See, most of us, the reason why we experience such church hurt is because we've been in the ark so long, we forgot how bad the crocodiles are. It's quiet in this Holy Ghost filled church. We have been protected in the ark so long that we forgot there's crocodiles trying to kill us. So what we do is we look at the ark and say, I need you to be more comfortable. Can you believe how long that pastor preached Sunday? Can you believe he didn't wear a tie? Can you believe he's got a receding hairline? What y'all laughing at? Church too cold, church too hot. These seats aren't comfortable. I'm standing up here for an hour. The music, the music ain't my style. Really? Really? Well, at least you ain't dealing with crocodiles. Come on, everybody ought to just praise the Lord. Everybody ought to just worship. Just give God thanksgiving and, and we can't give him praise. Because our daughter didn't get the lead part in the mind. All of a sudden, Jesus is not worthy. I'm preaching now, and I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to everybody else listening. Because we forgot how good we have it in the ark. I ain't going to church no more. Dealing with a bunch of hypocrites. Okay, good, good. We have hypocrites in here. You have hippos out there. Come on. Come on. You, you're dealing with small little mouse issues inside of the ark. Can I say it the way I want to say it? I'm, I'm getting tired, so let me say it the way I want to say it. You ready? If the only thing, no, let me say, if the greatest issue in your life is something that happens in 90 minutes on Sunday morning, is your life really that bad?
I want you to think about this. If the greatest issue in your life is how long I preach, or, or that the previous pastor at the church you came from didn't acknowledge you for your Christmas production, to where you can't even go to church for two years after it's done. Is your life really that hard? Maybe we ought to open the lid and remind you of the crocodiles that tried to take you out called poverty. The crocodiles called drug addiction. The croc Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. We ought maybe we ought to take your kid and let them really see what real issues are outside of the ark. We've lost our thankfulness. Moses had to endure the Nile and he had to go through the crocodiles, but he had something that he was in that protected his purpose in spite of what that thing had to... See, it's the church's job to deal with what's going on with the crocodiles. It's our job. It's our, it's our mandate to get in the water and to rescue as many people out from the crocodiles' mouths as possible. That's our job. But we can't reach them out of the mouths of the crocodiles if we're always trying to send the encouragement committee to pray for your gout. Come on, y'all. I'm serious. I'm serious. I want to remind us where we came from and that if it had not have been for the Lord on our side. And I understand the friendly fire of faith called church hurt. I get it. Trust me. You don't know what this church, this church was birthed through great pain and through prophetic purpose. But man was never my source anyway. So when people fell, I didn't. Because my faith was in him, not in the humanity of everyone else that was in leadership. She put him in an ark. And I love this. She placed him, she laid the ark on the edge of the river bank. Watch this. He was on the edge because he was put in an ark that was placed on the edge. You want me to tell you why we're edgy around here? You want me to tell you why I preach very real and very upfront? It's not because I'm angry. It's because I just refuse to let victims who were called to be victorious remain there. Press, you're not crushed. Pastor, you don't understand, I'm half dead. But what about the half of you that's living? See, that's my job is to help you see what you got. Moses stands before God and says, your purpose is so big on me, but I don't have anything to lead with. So he looks at him and says, well, what you got in your hand? I got a stick. That'll work. Because your supernatural purpose is not contingent upon you. It's what I put in you. As a matter of fact, do you know what the name Moses means? His name literally means the brought out one. The moment he was born, it was a prophecy that he would be brought out. So no wonder he was brought out of the generation and put in hiding. And no wonder he was brought out of hiding and put in the ark. And no wonder the ark was brought out and put in the river. And no wonder the Pharaoh's daughter found the ark and brought Moses out of the river. And no wonder he was placed in Pharaoh's house, but in due season he had to be brought out of Pharaoh's house. And no wonder he went into the wilderness and met God, and God brought him out of the wilderness and put him in leadership position. And no wonder he went back into the Pharaoh's territory and brought out the people because he is a brought out person. Therefore, he's connected. Everyone connected is coming out too. So when they faced the Red Sea, no wonder they were delivered because his name was delivered. Because long before he was a deliverer, he was being delivered time after time after time after time.
The ark is the place where your purpose is protected. If somebody told you that you were never going to have a problem as long as you were saved, somebody lied to you. That's what you call a false prophet. The way we would say it is you a lie and the truth ain't in you. That's the way we would say it. Moses still had to endure the Nile, but he was in something that could make it through. Noah still had to endure the flood, but he was in something that could make it through. My question to you today is, are you here or are you in? You see, contrary to what middle school boys believe, just because you're in the bathroom and have the shower on doesn't mean you're being washed. Just because the shower's running and you're by it doesn't mean you're getting clean. Just because you showed up doesn't mean you get to check the box of being in the place where your purpose is protected. Are you here or are you in? Because I learned something in my 20s. Just because you're here doesn't mean you're here that's why the cell phone reception is so bad in this room because if you're going to be here you might as well be here bow your heads for a moment I'm done Father, I pray for every Moses in this room. Those who have supernatural purpose that has divinely been placed in their life. Moses, take your place. Father, I pray for those who feel isolated and alone today. Those who feel hidden and feel like no one cares or no one even knows. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm praying specifically for a spouse who lays in bed every day beside their spouse. And their spouse is unaware of the isolation and the loneliness they feel. Moses. I say today you begin to grow. Grow. Pastor, what do I grow in? Grow in wisdom and in stature just like Jesus. Grow in wisdom. For those who have ex experienced extended seasons of isolation, I hear the Lord telling me to tell somebody in this room that season is about to be over and I can hide you no longer. <laughs> oh, I hear a revealing coming in the spirit. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. I, I hear a revealing coming in the spirit. You're about to be to the point he can hide you no longer. You've grown and you've passed the test that you were required to pass. And the Lord says, I'm about to review you because I can hide you no longer. You cannot take your place if I don't allow you to step into it. Today, I hear the Lord saying the alarm is about to sound. And you're about to step into your place because I can hide you in this season no longer. I feel the Holy Ghost. For those of us, God, for every Moses in this room, this became bitter because of the friendly fire of faith called church hurt. I pray, Lord, for gratefulness and healing. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I pray for the spirit of Joseph to sit on them. It says, you meant it for evil, 
but God turned it for my good. I pray that the healing balm of Gilead would be their portion today. And that like the salve, you would go over the wound of their spirit. And they would have a broken spirit before you, but not allowed their spirit to be broken because of man. I feel him healing in this room right here. Father, thank you. I thank you for being on the edge. I thank you for being on the edge. I'm telling you, somebody is on the edge today. And I came not as a pastor, but more of a prophet to tell you, you're about to tip over into your new season. You're about to tip over into your new season. You're about to tip over into your new season. I hear the Lord saying, you've been on the edge long enough. I'm a, the current is about to whip you into your new season. You're a little teapot, short and stout. And the Lord's about to tip you over and pour you. You don't hear what I'm saying. I'm prophesying now. I know it's nursery rhyme. It's childlike faith. But I hear the Lord saying, I'm about to tip you over. And I'm about to pour you out. You're about to step into your new seat. You're on the edge, the edge, the edge, the edge. Stand with me all over the room if you're in here. Just stand with me. Father, lift up your hands right here. I'm on the edge. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I felt it shift in that moment. I, I felt it. I felt it right now. Healing is yours. Deliverance is yours. The growth necessary in the hidden seasons is your portion. The focus that is required for it, Lord, tip them over into the, you brought them to the edge in this church today so that they would know that this season is about to go. I hear you, I hear you, Lord, that you're about to go from the edge of the last glory to an edge of new glory. You're, you're about to tip over from old faith into new faith. You're about to tip over from old strength into new strength. God is about to reveal the newness of what he, he's edge, the edge, the edge, the edge, the edge. If you knew what he was taking you to you would praise him because of what's coming more than what you've had to endure yeah 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 i hear the lord saying that the depth of your valley is an indicator of the zenith of the pinnacle the mountain you're about to walk in Somebody just worship right here. Just worship. I, just worship. Just worship. I don't know what that is. Just tell God what he means to you. Talk to him like he's got leaned in and he's got you've got his ear. Look at me for a moment. Look at me for a moment. Look at me for a moment. I want you to hear me because I said it. I said it very brass. I said it very brash. I, I said it very direct. And the Lord said that the spirit of offense went up in this room. Your pain is not petty. Pain is not petty. Don't mistake genuine pain as trivial and pettiness for those that have been wounded in church it's not what I meant pain is not petty but the Lord said somebody somebody in this room when you allowed that pain that I've healed you from years ago to still stay on the surface you have been picking a wound I have healed a long time ago it becomes petty when that's all you can say. I remember the day when we walked out of the season, we were sitting down with the pastors after the pain we went through of, of being rejected, fired, whatever you want to call it. We were sitting at a restaurant with another pastor that we didn't know, and we were, we we're spewing our venom. And we walked out of that meeting, we sat down and we said, never again will that be the first thing we communicate because we're now just picking a scab of what God has been healing in our life. I'm here today to tell you, let the scab fall off. It's time for the wound to not be the third, first thing that comes out of your mouth. 
your pain is not petty. But if he's healed you, talk about what he's done in spite of what they did. Father, I just ask you for divine healing in this moment in Jesus' name. This is completely different than the first service, but I feel like it is just as anointed. Yeah, yeah, I just... Healing in Jesus' name. Healing in Jesus' name. Healing in Jesus' name. Healing in Jesus' name. Purpose. 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 Troy T. Shell, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Tim and Cheryl, I want you to come forward. I'm about to pray and dismiss and bless you forth in, in, in power. If I see you at 630, man, it'd be an honor. If not, I completely understand. At the end of the first service, at the end of the first service, the Lord, the Lord spoke to me. The Lord spoke to me. And told me to tell the first service, and I feel that same prompted in this service that you have allowed your gift to be dormant long enough. It's time to be in. It's time to get in. It's time to get in. If this is the ark that God is calling you to, get in. If you know the ark that God is calling you to, get in. Get in. Just get somewhere. Besides in the river by yourself. You hear what I'm saying? Our elders, two, uh, two of our elders, couples, are at the front today. Because somebody is going to walk out of here and not activate their assignment and going to be disobedient to God. And they're here today because I want you to be accountable. Because when you speak it, something has to shift in the earth. For you not to activate in your assignment is to be disobedient to God. And you have lived and you have healed, but you have not activated because the last time the gift was stirred in you, it got rejected and it caused pain in the ark you were in last. Listen to me. Don't judge me through the filter of your last person called pastor. It is unfair you set me up for failure. When you look at me, you peer th through the filter of what your past is. Because I'm going to let you in on a secret. There is one head of this church, and it is not Glenn. Jesus is the head of this church. Every Here it is. You ready? Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You remember? If Jesus is building this church, hell can't get in. If Glenn is building this church, hell's already in. Do you understand? Can I say it the way I want to say it? Because it's hell to go to a church that's all about a man. It is. Been there, done that. Today, if this is your ark and you're not activated... It's time for you to stir up the gift of God on the inside of you. Because to walk out and not activate is to be in disobedience. If you're still searching, I'm not even talking to you in this moment. Holy Spirit, thank you for this day. You've turned this into deep waters. And I'm thankful for that. Because I believe you're doing deep works. Holy Spirit, lead, and we will follow. 
for every person under the sound of my voice. I bless you with Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 11. And I say, may the Lord, the God of your fathers, may he increase you a thousand times more than what you are, and may he fulfill every promise that he has given you. We ask it in the name above every name, the name of Jesus, our Savior. Somebody just lift up your hands and give him one last praise before you leave. Give him one last praise before you leave. Come on, give him one last praise before you leave.